my gym. Hey folks, it's Jim. Morning, Jim. Morning, Robert. Hey. Small group today, huh? Yeah, so far. Folks usually jump on a little late, I think. Yep, we can wait a few more minutes and see if anyone else is joining and get started maybe at five past. Sounds good. Hey, uh, Jim, Robert, Kristen, good morning. Morning. Morning, Raj. Hey, Raj. We'll give folks a couple more minutes and get started at five past. Right, should we get rolling? Yes, we should. All right, so it looks like the only item we have on the agenda today is to go through the policy white paper outline. So we've discussed this in a few prior meetings and I think the intent was to get to a point where we have an outline and then we'll transfer the outline into a Git repo or a folder in our Git repo where we can kind of collaborate and pick on different sections. So here's what some of us, you know, worked on. We had a breakout session also last week and came up with in terms of the, so I kind of uh, went and cleaned up a few of the things, moved a bunch of the notes and other kind of placeholders into the detail section, but, and we can revisit. But what the outline looks like at this point, you know, something like this. I think there's about three main sections and maybe there needs to be one more, which we can talk about. I'll, I'll mention what I was thinking of there. It seems like the main sections would be the scope uh, of where the policy applies, right? So we talked about the cluster components, container images, resources, so resource configurations, uh, the runtime uh, of the cluster components itself. And then uh, we had a placeholder for multi-cluster, right? To see if there's anything that needs to be called out there. 
And so that's in the policy, you know, I just titled that scope or policy scope. We can sort of change these and get more feedback. Then there was an architecture or a how it works sort of details type of section, right? Which um, I think Jaya has mostly uh, you know, kind of filled in the major components which we would be looking at. So there's the definition language, the authoring point, like where are these policies managed and stored like upstream GitOps repo or some other management plane. Or I guess there's an authoring point and a management point. So those are called out separately. There's the enforcement points, which could be, there could be multiple like the CI CD pipeline, as well as um, admission control and then runtime. And then the policy reporting, which we can talk about uh, for the CRD. And then we have a section on mappings, integrations. And I think I'd seen use cases. Yeah, use cases is also here. So we can kind of figure out what to put in this and, um, but maybe before we go to those sections, I think those need to be refined a little bit more. Let's, does this general structure and these major areas, does that seem relatively good to everyone? Any thoughts, feedback? On what them, um, hello, this is Radna. Um, I just joined, sorry, I was late. Um, um, I, I do think we need um, to expand this mappings and integration section. Um, detection is important, right? Um, when a policy violation happens. Um, so a subsection under the mappings and integration or a separate chapter on detection of policy violations or changes that are happening um, can be detected right. on from a cyber perspective. I, I, I agree. I, I was wondering, do we need, uh, looking at the outline level, Jim, do we need kind of like a policy life cycle, which would include like the, the detection of policy violations or policy enforcement? Um, I'm just wondering, is there, is there right. a, I, maybe there's an overview, maybe it's just a, a sentence, maybe it's just a, a diagram, but do we kind of need to like enumerate the, the phases? So, you know, policy definition, policy deployment, policy enforcement, policy, violation detection policy, not violation detection. I don't know what the right word like is. Like success um, <laughs> cases, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the policy is right. actively being enforced, you know, so monitoring, I guess, is probably a better word. Sorry. Right. sorry. Uh, so there was some aspect of a life cycle. Drifting and drift, maybe, even? Right. Yeah, so there was some aspect of a life cycle in these, you know, components, but maybe we could, uh, in the architecture, perhaps there's a component section and then there's a life cycle, um, you know, to show um, both. And then some mappings and integration. Yeah, I'm not sure what exactly the intent of that was. And um, I don't know, to your point, I'm not sure if detection would fit in there or if it should be in, in the chapter yeah. section, right? We lost Jim. Can... Okay. The idea of mapping and integration that we had was that I think when you talk about the life cycle, where we entered in the previous section was around uh, you know how do you author policies, how do you manage policies, enforce policies, all the way to report them, and the question is what do you do after that, right? And that was the idea behind the mappings and integration. So my recollection was this was more, it started about as we were talking about from operational to compliance to what other teams ex, you know, outside of the Kubernetes domain would want to see. And yeah, that, is correct. that was the, yeah. what we would put in there. Integration yep. with the steel layer as well, right? Every Kubernetes might have, some Kubernetes implementations will have Istio mesh, right? Service mesh and if we don't want to call it steel, that's fine. But some integration of policies because you don't want to have conflicting policies at different layers. Mm -hmm. So I think mappings and integrations, we should specify which all integrations are we focusing on. I mean, from a cyber perspective, these things make sense, definitely. But which all integrations are right. we addressing? 
Yeah, maybe we need to, yeah. we might need to separate those, right? We say mappings to saying, okay, you have the operational policies of the Kubernetes layer. Perhaps you have some Istio policies, other policy objects. What comes above it, right? How do I translate this into compliance and regulatory um, into that domain? Right. So yeah, and maybe we could call out integration separately. We can talk about, you know, things like service mesh. So integrations should be before the mappings then, right? In terms of uh, hierarchy, because um, detection and SOC compliance that should be on the integrated system rather than just the Kubernetes at that point. I don't know, that's, that's my opinion, but open to- Yeah, any. I think the, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Jaya. I think the mapping and integrations was more focused on things external like Jim was saying to Kubernetes, right? So if you have a customer who is who has existing tools that they use to manage, uh, you know, compliance or other uh, uh, processes, right, that they have, how do you integrate this architecture into that, right? So, so that was the focus. Whereas something like service mesh. Jay, you cut out. We can't hear you anymore. Into the table that you had in the pre in the, earlier in the document. Jay, uh, you cut out for a bit. If you could repeat the last uh, sentence, please. We heard something like service mesh and then nothing for a bit. Maybe she okay. can't address. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that ma that makes sense. So we just need to understand what what we want to cover in each section. I think here really the the goal was okay. Now that we have these policies, we have the reports, the violations. Who's going to care about them, and how do we, you know, kind of use them, right? All right. Um, I understand the, the fit of detection here. And I think that's Aradhana brought this up. Um, so policy can be a preventative policy, a detective policy or a corrective policy, right? Why specifically just call out detection here? What is the idea? I mean, uh, detection for me is if somebody, um, something malicious is going on, right? Somebody is maliciously changing a policy, then somebody in the cybersecurity team would want to know, right? Um, my focus is cybersecurity. That's why I'm, I'm thinking from that perspective. Okay. Right. I, I think the, 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 the idea, well, a lot, I mean, you're absolutely right. Most cybersecurity today is detective and remediation based, you know, and, and vulnerability based in particular in a lot of cases. But um, yeah, I think there is an evolution towards, especially in Kubernetes, you're, you're a state based system, right? You're a declarative system. So if you, if you declare your policy correctly and that's enforced by the infrastructure as code, then you're, you, you in a sense shouldn't have any vulnerabilities you shouldn't have any violations right but right. you still want to have controls that are reporting compliance that are reporting policy enforcement right does that make sense no i i'm not against that uh, stri i I'm, I'm 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 not questioning that what i'm saying is that I, uh, the the point i'm trying to make is that i see that orthogonal right uh what i mean is irrespective of what policies we have in the life cycle we talked about from a policy perspective Right, whether you author it, you enforce it, you can do this, enforce this through three mechanisms, right? You can put that ahead. I mean, we're talking about the CI CD pipeline and that as a use case, for example, that is a preventative type of a mechanism, right? Uh, at least in most cases. Then you can have detective. We have not talked about corrective at all, right? Sort of the GitOps based remediation workflows. My, so, my question is uh, should we expand this to Aradhana's point? To cover these other things because if you just call out detection i'm just trying to understand what does that mean right what does that mean for preventative sort of policies and corrective sort well, of 
to be explicitly called out. That's my Even point. a preventative policy could be maliciously changed by an attacker. And that's what we want to detect on as well. So maybe detection of changes to policies, whether they're preventative or detective in runtime, as well as in the... Yes. Yeah, I agree. I, and and I, I mean, that's what I meant earlier by drift. I'll, I'll clarify that. Yes, malicious or unintended changes to the policies themselves. I agree. I think that is a concern. Uh, just circle back, Raj. Um, I agree, though I myself, how do we express a preventative or corrective policy in, in the frameworks that we currently have? Like we have admission control. Yeah. But where else, where else can well, we-, we I mean, the common set of policies, right? Most things that we have in CIS run as non-root are all preventative policies, right? You can't execute though you can't execute those containers until unless you have you adhere to those policies. A detective policy is more typically happens in the action uh, access control, right? Post facto. I maybe we are using different terms here. I'm just yeah. I'm, right. Yeah. I, I just wanted to call out because when when you typically read uh, the policy papers on NIST, right? The, the, the way that they categorize is along those four buckets. These are the terms they use. And that's why I'm calling them out. Yeah, no, no, I, I absolutely agree with the terms. I'm, I'm literally trying to wrap my brain around like at the Kubernetes level. Cause I mean, you know, the, the goal of this white paper is to kind of get a little bit under the, the details and, and drill down into how do you actually implement this? Um, you know, not prescriptively, here's the code, but, you know, taking it a little Raj, would you give an example of a detective policy? A detective policy, typically an access control. A termination control is a very classic example of a detective policy, right? You have turned the user, the user continues to have role bindings, right? Or, or super and bin access, right, into a cluster. And you want, you are trying to evaluate if those access are valid. That's an example. The second thing could be, for example, that you have a cluster and you, have, you do not have logging enabled on that cluster, right? You don't have stack drivers, you don't have Azure log analytics. So things like this, right? Which is post facto, we are, you are observing this out of bank is what do you typically yeah. call detective? Yeah, detective yeah. policies are more uh, oriented toward runtime, right? Meaning after the workload right. already deployed and running and everything, you know, how do you monitor, right? On an ongoing basis, right? Whereas preventive or more like admission control, Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Both both are fine. And 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 um, one one comment I have that there, Jaya and Raj, is that uh, great. If we have those detective policies, then we should have we should identify how those uh, those detections are remediated. Is there automation yes. being built around that as well? So yeah. uh, I, I think detection and maybe detective policies can be a subset of the detection itself. Right, they, they, they're kind of correlated. And then uh, for those detective policies, we can further expand as to what kind of auto remediation can take place in certain mm -hmm. cases. I, I think Jim has done a good job of sort of putting those bullets there as well. I, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, Aradhana, I'm just pointing it out. And I think he has sort of added yeah. those line items there in the-, gotcha. in the yeah, yeah, so one thing I would, I would add to that though is, um, what we're seeing is that really every policy, even a policy which is intended to be enforced needs detection because there's always use cases where um, <laughs> you, you wanna do the additional runtime scan, right? So yep. I don't think it's such a you know um, concrete categorization in, in that sense, because uh, as you're rolling out and this goes back to what Robert was saying with versioning and drift, so let's say there's a new CV. Now you want to roll out a policy. There's existing workloads. In most cases, you're not going to bring down those existing workloads, but you're going to detect if those violate the new policy, and you're going to take some remediation action, which could span some time. So I think um, both. It's what we're seeing, at least with Kiverno policies, is you are going to run every policy, even if it's uh, configured to block it still has a component where it will detect workloads which violate that policy for any reason. Maybe you have bypassed the admission web hook, maybe there was an upgrade going on, or maybe it's just a new policy like I described, right? So it seems to me that their detection is always required for every policy. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree completely. I think um, also, you know, there may be resources that were created before a policy was put in place, right? Exactly. So that is why you have the gatekeeper, for example, has both admission as well as audit Correct. Uh, use cases, right? So, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I agree with Ara on the remediation aspect, right? I think whenever possible, uh, obviously, you know, not every policy can auto remediate, but if there's a right. way to do it, that's an option that we need to think about. Yeah. And that remediation could also be in a separate system. So maybe this is this is just, you know, it's detected, you remediate in your Git uh, or upstream repo and you push changes, but there needs to be some, you know, kind of guidance on remediation for uh, once violations are reported, things like that. Yep. Okay. So yeah, no, this looks good. I think uh, I'm not, maybe perhaps we can combine these two sections. I'm not sure if you know they, or we can move lifecycle book before architecture, or I don't know how we'll have to see how this plays out. But I think these this covers all the right points. Yep, I think so. Okay. Um, so integrations, we briefly mentioned things like service mesh. Are those just part of Kubernetes workloads or should we, I mean, I, I understand it's not a application, it's more of a infrastructure component, but it is in, in some ways, it's a bunch of CRDs, right? So is do we need to give that special treatment or do we just say it's a Kubernetes resource that's covered as part of uh, any resource policy, um, like when we're doing configuration security, configuration checks. So in addition to config, I mean, so, and, and apologies, maybe you already have this covered, but when it comes to any of the network things, right, there's the config and then there's what's actually happening and observability. Right. And, and so, so policy, yep, I might have a config policy how are you going to assess if there's a violation of that policy or is that not part of this no so that we were thinking would be covered in the runtime like okay um, perfect you know, yep makes sense so yeah you're very right like how do i know if my cni is even working right because yep. i may have all the network policies configured but if my cni has a issue yeah i don't know um Right. So I, yeah, and that, that is slightly more difficult. Those type of things are harder to audit, right? Because you would actually need something like Sonaboy or uh, another runtime tool, which is doing behavioral tests to make sure that things are working as expected. Okay, uh, so let's take another quick look at the overall outline. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the question still is, I mean, we can leave this integrations for now and see if anything comes up, but otherwise uh, we can, um, yeah, uh, otherwise we'll see if it collapses into some other section. On the use cases, I added configuration security, operational compliance, regulatory compliance, and supply chain. Um, do those seem appropriate or as we're saying, these are use cases for Kubernetes policies? I, I think we just said run, well, I guess runtime is under operation. No. <laughs> I mean, supply chain obviously is very wide, but I think there is a component there that has to be done in cluster or at admission control. So that would be interesting to call out. It would be helpful to, at least in my mind, Jim, to be very specific on the use case. So if we are talking about supply chain and the question is, for example, how something like a Solari gate, right? Uh, this policy, uh, um, uh, project will help or if you're talking about regulatory or maybe not regulatory compliance if you're talking about a sort of industry compliance right security compliance something like pc ideas or high trust i think it will be and then we can obviously expand that to others right but i think the more specific we are the better it is right 
Yeah, so you're, I think we can, you know, maybe replace this with something like image provenance or whatever is the right component, but ultimately the use case, I guess the higher level use case that we'll be mapping into is... Um, so right, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the goal is to outline here and then we'll, volunteers will fill in the specific use case. Okay. Right, and then on the mappings, we had incident management, compliance mappings, OSCAL, and then I think last time we just started talking about security operation center, SOC, and what users there would require. Um, any other upper upstream mappings that come to mind? Yeah, I think vulnerability management tends to be separate from those items. Uh, it may feed into a SOC, but there's often a different team for vulnerability management as well. And SOC is an interesting subject when it comes to container platforms, you know. True. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, in, uh, the jury is still out. Um, I've had a number of conversations in the industry about SOC for, um, you know, Kubernetes platforms. Um, SOC teams are at a loss as to what they are supposed to do. Right. Um, so it'll be good if we can address something here. But yeah, I, I think I've heard similar and isn't it? It's basically they're just using this umbrella term of, oh, that's now DevOps. So they don't know what that means, but they know it means not SOC. <laughs> Ooh, but that brings up a really good point, right? Because is there uh, a DevSecOps dashboard, right. I, I, you know, it may be a DevOps dashboard and, and in fact, so where does that live and what does that look like? I think there would be both. So there'd be the DevOps and I'm just going to arbitrarily draw the line like DevOps is getting my stuff into the cluster and it's running. And then from that point, DevSecOps is, you know, maintaining the yeah. compliance gonna, to vulnerability. I'm going to strongly disagree because DevOps is supposed to always include security <laughs> in the pipeline. And the reason people, you know, started using the DevSecOps term is because it keeps getting forgotten. So, so a DevOps pipeline should include security scanners and it should include a security dashboard for managing the results. So it's if, if you're doing security only on the ops side of, of DevOps, you're missing. I completely right. agree. I, I'm just mm -hmm. reporting from the field. <laughs> yeah, and I think we need to help change that thinking. Um, and, and actually most DevOps pipelines I know of include at least vulnerability scanning. Right. Yeah, so I, I guess the question, and I think we've had this conversation in several forums is, is it the DevOps team that's transforming into a DevSecOps team, or is it more the central security team that's learning about Kubernetes? And, and, and I think we can't, that? yeah, and we can't prescribe that, right. but I think we, <laughs> right. what we can say is that policy information should be part of you know, policy should be part of DevOps. It should inform DevOps and and policy okay. and security. And at least this would be my opinion. It should so, should be included as uh, an external you know place we'd want to set. You know, information should be available. Well, I, I mean, I think that, I mean to your point, Kirsten. This is our chance to put a line in the sand and say, here recommendations. I, I will say from from the government world that I interact with, um, they're just trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I don't know that they have. They, I think they would read this and you know and many other white papers, but they would they would use this our guidance as what is a best practice and uh, yeah. And and you know the DoD published you know right. uh, the the DevSecOps reference architecture not that long ago. So there there's continuing push. Granted, it's it's hard for organizations to make the shift, and so. You know, I think we just want to include it as as part of where do we think this information should be provided or support those teams that are actually doing right. DevSecOps. So we have called that out as our primary audience. So yeah. from, you know, from the mappings point of view, I think the way we, at least I was thinking of it is everything we we're saying is targeted to the DevSecOps team, but then they have to realize that there's these other mappings 
including perhaps central security, which needs, you know, periodic reports or some visibility into what's going on in the Kubernetes world, right? Um, at least that seems like the view we have taken here, like we're going from the practitioners out. And when we say, so, so again, so I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking from the tools angle, because that seems to be what the mappings is about. Where is, is the rest of this paper indicate that this information is going to show up in some sort of DevSecOps dashboard? Um, it's, yeah, there's no one single thing we're calling out here, right? So we're yeah, saying there's I don't policy think reports. Right, because there isn't really a single DevSecOps dashboard in existence right. yet, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so we're talking about reporting, we're talking about uh, metrics somewhere. We, we, I believe we had metrics, but maybe that fell off. Would it would it simplify things if we said reporting, you know, reporting and information should show up in pipelines? Or is that um, implied above? Or yeah, stated? So, yeah. Right. So in the enforcement points and in the life cycle, we do want to call out that, of course, you can. So policies can be applied in the CI CD pipeline. So that's what we were talking about here, out of cluster admission controls and then runtime is the three enforcement points. So okay. each one could produce reports. Um, okay, maybe leave it for now because there isn't right now, but but so, so the other thing we see right there are security dashboards in AWS and let me see if I can find an example of one. Okay, let's, let's leave it yeah. for now, yeah. Yeah, that would be good to call out and see, like, you know, give it. So we we had a discussion on, I think what we decided is we could potentially reference projects, um, especially CNCF projects, but ideally we'll just stay away from- Company. Uh, right, yeah. any, any product or right. even perhaps projects because things change and once the paper's out, we don't want to kind of look like sure. uh, there's any favorites or anything like that, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, and yeah, we could certainly uh, normalize it, but yeah. So, so yeah, let's leave it alone for now. Give it some more thought. Sounds good. Okay. Um, any, any other ideas or thoughts or things we should cover, which, which is not in this outline so far? No, I think the outline looks great to me. Um, I'm just excited uh, that we are working, going to work on this white paper and so wondering what the next steps are. Yeah, so what we can do is we will, you know, we can formalize this outline or just at least create the sections in a Git repo. And we uh, like we'll just use Markdown for authoring. The other thing we could also do is, I don't know, um, I mean, Robert and Aradna, I think uh, both of you also, you know, work with um, SIG security. So would it, is it too early to kind of get feedback on this outline or should we? No, um, we also stuff? have a leads meeting on Friday. Um, okay. chair leads, so I will share this there as well because I give okay. updates to the leads um, on uh, this policy working group. Yep. Okay. And um, we can share in the next Wednesday's meeting. Today is kind of too soon to put it on the agenda. Um, right. But we can start working on this while that is yes. happening in parallel, right? Nothing exactly. is stopping us from making progress here. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and I join the Kube SIG security meetings periodically too. And I'm, there's there's work on a white paper planned there that's more okay. you know more directly security focused. So I think okay. I think this is a good time to share. Yeah, right. but, uh, but uh, 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 Kristen. Um, I don't know if that I had proposed that you know security policies um, was the uh, white paper that we were going to work okay. on. Okay. Yep. Does it make sense to do a separate security policy document, or I, we can include you know what? security in this as well, right? I'd I'd have to go back and take a look at the the outline that was proposed in the Kube security sig. My sense was it was fairly different from this, but and and I could see there being a, a need for differences. Um, so, but it's, so all the more reason to share, right? 
I, I would. Um, it, all, it sounds like we're, we all drift in and out of those same same meetings. Yeah. Um, I would think that the Kube security focus would be more on things like the the, the RBAC, the admission control configuration of the cluster managing yeah. certs exactly. I, I mean yeah kind of a lower level i think than than what's here but but obviously if you have a different recollection um aradna uh, you know either either way if we share the outline it'll generate a good sure. conversation right yeah and it may be good to get if there's somebody from each uh, and i know like uh um, a lot of folks on this call are also in those forums. So as long as we make sure uh, there's coordination, I think that that would be great. Sure. Um, so I will take the action to review this and this security next week and then bring okay. any feedback from there on. Um, but if we want to start making progress, I'm good with that. Yeah, and absolutely. Let me know which sections I can work on. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so we can, the next thing I'll, uh, I can do is I'll set up the Git structure and at least, you know, we'll have the, uh, the various directories for the, the, and the markdown files, and then we can figure out who wants to work on what. And, and just to kind of clarify, so there's, uh, I think Kirsten, you were talking about the Kube SIG security, Aradna, you're talking about the CNCF SIG security, right? Right, I'm talking I about was going to security, ask that. not cube security. <laughs> okay, that's why I put kube yeah. in front of mine. Right. To, to, yeah, so the kube SIG security team was looking at a white paper, and, and I'm less aware of the CNCF SIG security. Yep. In, in my mind, I, I mean, this isn't like the defined admission, uh, but I kind of think of the, the CNCF SIG security is kind of like the overarching, like all things cloud native. Right. We're kind of at the middle ground of, you know, policy applied to Kubernetes and related stuff. And then the kube security is super focused on, you know, the, almost at the API level, layer. That's at least how I organize it in my brain. <laughs> so when I go to the various meetings, I kind of know where my, my the context is. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think that uh matches at least my way of thinking too and i think there's certainly each one is a very large area all right um i didn't have anything else on the agenda and unless uh, someone else has any other topics to discuss uh we can break early then for today and i'll you know set this up and get and send out uh, something on slack I think that's great. That's great. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank all you. Right. All. Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks.